Hi right, guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 430, featuring the fifth, and I'm sad to say, final installment of my interview with the great Trent Oster, the CEO of Beamdog and veteran of BioWare. Uh, in this part of the interview, we talk a lot about his uh, Axis and Allies online game. Uh, we talk some more about his uh, plans for the future, multiplayer games. We take all uh, uh, some fan questions. Uh, let's see what else we talk about. There's a lot of game design uh, questions come up, uh, the do's and don'ts, things Trent has learned, lessons about uh, game development and game design. In short, there's a whole lot of great material here, so stay tuned. I also want to say that right after this, I will have a sneak peek and an announcement from my uh, next guest uh, for Matt Chat, namely George Zeitz. And uh, George will be on to make a big announcement about some of his uh, uh, plans for the immediate future. I know you'll be interested in that, so be sure to stick around uh, after this segment with Trent. Uh, anyway, obviously we have a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Trent Oster. So here's a question from Michael Sullivan. A lot of these guys, you have to watch them because they slip in like two questions for the price of one. So it's, oh, Michael, <laughs> it like he's terrible. Win. He's always doing this. <laughs> sounds like a never winner fan. Yeah. Okay, so I think I'll go ahead and just go ahead and ask both. Okay. So what did Beamdog learn from Siege of Dragon Spear? And do they have any plans for more original content, either games or expansions? Also, here's the second bit. Also, how many dollars would I need to donate so that Beamdog can make a Planescape Torment sequel with Chris Avalone as lead designer? <laughs> <laughs> so part one, what did we learn with Siege of Dragon Spear? I think... I think the key learning on Siege of Dragon Spear was be tighter with our scope, be clear on what the desired end product is, and be very focused on that. I think the other is really pay attention through kind of our editing and our polishing pass. Mm -hmm. We had bugs in the database that got lost and, and never addressed, and some of them, some of them were bugs that came back and hit us pretty hard, where we had actually gone through and we had put effort into identifying it coming up with a plan on how to deal with it, but we never actually did the fix itself. Mm -hmm. It just somehow got dropped on the way through implementation. I think the other thing, we learned a lot of what the engine could do and couldn't do, and it, it gave us a good concept of where some of the weak spots were that we then kind of fixed up in later patches to the engine itself and actually improved everything and stepped it forward. Like, I look at it as there's the Dragon Spear that launched, and then there's the Dragon Spear of today, and the Dragon Spear of today has actually we fixed a lot of those kind of technical problems that did emerge and, and we solved architectural problems in the engine that made Baldur's Gate better, that made Baldur's Gate 2 better, that made Icewind Dale better, that also fixed up Caesar Dragon Spear stuff that, that popped out. And I, I think the other kind of key learning is, is that great voice actors are a lot of fun to work with and like bringing back everybody, David Warner, Bringing back Minsk, that was the Jim Cummings on Minsk. It was, it was Jim so much Cummings. fun. He must be. What's he like? He's awesome. He is truly awesome. He went off on some outtakes. We got them back, and they were just hilarious. You should see if I can find those someday and <laughs> release a couple of them. But he's just hes a professional voice actor. He rolls in, and, and he listens to kind of the previous work he's done, and you can hear him as he just – shifts gears and boom he's minsk again and it's it's just awesome yeah i think he did he do like darkwing duck or oh Wing yeah he was, like what this can't be the same guy you, you look at his record <laughs> and he's he is literally like the jeremy irons of the voice acting world he's oh. always working he's always making money and he's always getting it done i think that's so the a second one of my friends can always pick him out and to me, it's just like, that's such a great voice actor. If I don't even realize it's the same person, <laughs> like yeah. I have to look it up. <laughs> like, oh, it's him again. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. And then, uh, so the second part of that question, Planescape Torment, we'd actually put together a complete package on doing a follow-up to Planescape. Mm -hmm. We had uh, initially, we titled it Unraveled. and obviously focused on a story around Ravel Puzzlewell. And uh, ultimately, we just couldn't find a partner who would, who would fund the project. Because it was a little more adventurous, um, we had bigger plans for it. It was going to cost a lot more money. Um, we were going to use a different engine. We were going to do it Unreal based. So I she didn't want to go to Kickstarter. Or, uh, or Kickstarter is a little terrifying. Or something. 
It's like three or four of them now, I guess. Yeah. Well, there was a there was a concern. I think at the time Hasbro didn't want to do any Kickstarters because they felt like it kind of negatively re- reflected on the company. So there was a real concern around that. Hmm. And there was. They, What's they the negative? Outright... How does it? <laughs> what is I, it? I, I don't know. I mean, it was just an internal concern they expressed to us, and they they just would prefer not to do it. Hmm. So ultimately, we backed away, and uh, we had actually pulled Chris in, and he was he was uh, collaborating on it because Chris actually helped us get the Planescape Torment version done, and he restored some of his original content for that. It was a lot of fun working with Chris again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've had I've him on the show him. a few times. He's, yeah, he's always great. He, he was, even wrote a he forward was, for our book, uh, New Dungeons and Desktops. That's awesome. Yeah, Chris is such a great guy. He's so much fun. Like I remember meeting him. Uh, like late '90s, we'd go down to visit Interplay. We'd be working on on late Shattered Steel or starting to work on Baldur's Gate, mm-hmm. and we'd meet this Chris guy, and he was just kind of this wild and crazy fellow, and he was just a ton of fun. Now, high energy. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so a couple people ask about this, and I wanted to sort of tie in these questions in, in with another one of your comments, which I liked a lot. Uh, so we got RPG chick. And Fabio Ciccioni, Ticconi Ticconi, not quite sure how to pronounce this, but they're both asking basically, you know, what are the plans for original content with Beamdog? I guess it'd be overhaul. Uh, Fabio was asking about, do you have any interest in making a D and D fifth edition game? Yeah, maybe I'll just stop there and let you <laughs> answer that because I'm very curious myself. <laughs> well, I, I look back and and. <laughs> There's a, there's a few things that really had these huge impact in my life. One of them was Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. It was it was just huge. It was this really formative thing for me. And and, and I think fantasy in general. I, I think it was my, my grade three librarian gave me The Hobbit. She was like, you've read through the other books. You didn't seem to enjoy Paddington Bear as much as the other kids. Here, why don't you read the this? Hobbit. So I read The Hobbit, and, and that kind of changed my world. And that led me into Conan, that led me into Dungeons and Dragons, that led me into this whole fantasy world. And, and uh, other things, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a history buff, not a great one, but World War II always, it was this amazing era to me. It was this, this focused technology advancements and, and this huge colossal struggle. So I've always been interested in that as a concept. So. We actually recently released our own Axis and Allies. Yeah, we need to get into that. I keep meaning to go back to uh, that. Yeah, but we got Axis and Online. Axis, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, Axis and Allies Online. Right. Yeah, Axis so, and Allies. Is it Axis, Axis and Allies 1942 Online? Yeah, that's correct. So Axis and Allies was one of the other things that was a huge impact in my childhood. I... I when I got into like late high school and early university, we used to play it together a lot, play with friends. It was, I had such warm memories around playing it and, and, and going back and forth and, and trying different strategies and different concepts. I really wanted to do something with it. And uh, there's, there's obviously got to be some good sides to owning a game dev company. And there is. You get to do the games you want to do. Yeah, I think so that's we, just so important. you know. And I'm always disappointed when I interview somebody and it doesn't sound... Well, I don't want to frame it negatively. Let me just say it positively. Like, listening to you, I watched the trailer. Uh, there, or the, I guess it's a trailer where you're talking about Axis and Online. Axis and Allies Online. <laughs> Sorry, I just can't yep. seem to say it. But, I mean, anybody watch that, you can tell that you are just so into this game. Like, you enjoy it. <laughs> it's so great. And that, to me, is a lot more just, like, I've got to play this. You know, look look at how excited he is to be playing the game. Even though he has he made it, you know, but at the same time likes to play it. You know, I notice some people don't really have that same connection to the games they make. It's more about, I don't want to say it's about the money, but, you know, it's they're more interested in making, they like making the game, but not necessarily yep. playing it. Whereas you come across as somebody that likes maybe both equally, or do you? <laughs> so to me, there's there's kind of the two parts. There's the craft of making something, yeah. and then there's the, the act of actually enjoying it. And I enjoy some games. I guess I'm 25 years into the industry at this point, so I am I am quite jaded. I can fire up a new game and I, I can be out of it in five minutes because it does some things that just upset me. But when I find a game that I really enjoy, I really get into it. And and while I'm making a game, 
I kind of fall in, I, I have ideas in my head that I fall in love with. It's like, I want to be able to do this because I think this will be the most amazing thing ever. And then I talk with the team about it and we come up with ideas on how we're going to implement it. We implement it. And most of the time it actually comes out even better than what's in my head. And I'm like, it's, it's like the secret sauce of collaborating with really skilled, fun people. And it just gets so much better. And it's, it's so awesome to see that. Mm -hmm. And then when you're starting to play it through and you see these, these concepts and ideas coming into reality and connecting and, and reinforcing each other and making the whole game better, it's just, a, you feel so excited. You just, I'll be playing the game and I'll just get up and I'll run down the hallway and I'll, I'll jabber at somebody excitedly and confuse the hell. And it was like, I did the thing with the stuff. I clicked the thing and it was awesome. It was so great. And they're like, he's happy. So this is good. So I don't know what the hell he's talking about, but he seems really happy. So I'll just nod and smile. Eventually I calm down and I'm like, yeah, the, the, you know, like this part of it where this is happening and, and, they when I finally calm down, everybody can understand what's going on. But there's those moments where everything kind of connects and clicks together. So for me, like we had an office that's I'd say probably half of the people or more had never played Axes and Allies. And through the course of building the game and just testing it internally, we've probably turned half of those people who've never played the game before into some of the most hardcore Axis and Allies players you can imagine. We've got one guy in the office, has, he's concocted about 30 different strategies, and based on wow. what you're doing, he'll be going through this very specific process, and he's really good at it now, and it's uh, he had never seen the game before. It's, it's just fun seeing that level of, of people playing, and, and the, the other kind of concept is that Microsoft, eat, eat the dog food, eat your own, play your own software. Mm -hmm. We have played thousands and thousands of games of Axis and Allies internally. Probably probably more games than most people have ever played tabletop in their life just because we we started iterating on it and tuning it and making it better and just in the end it's it's a really solid and really fun implementation of the game. And it's, I I guess to kind of seg into the real answer to the question like what's what's the future of Beamdog going forward? We're not going to be a huge AAA studio. We don't want to do that. I, 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 I want us to be way more artisanal and less factory. Artisanal gaming. I like that. Cause, cause I mean, we started off making games because I love games. We made shattered steel because giant robots blasting things and shooting missiles. It's, it sounded so exciting making a D and D RPG. That's awesome. It's so exciting. It's so great. Going in and having 300 people working on a game, everybody's contribution becomes so, so small and such a, it's almost like being a, a cog in the machine. Yeah. Whereas you lose that magic, you lose the use, that extra little bit, that love that people bring mm -hmm. to what they're doing, and they can make something so much better. Like when I look at Baldur's Gate, I run across like Easter eggs in there. It's like the the mark dara's tombstone you click on it eventually he'll spawn in and he's like quit clicking on my tombstone and you click on it again he'll spawn in uh, phoenix guards nobody told him to do that he just did that after hours because he thought it was awesome larry daryl and daryl that's a bob newhart reference that that john winsky threw in after hours because he thought it was fun things that are crafted out of love like that are amazing and when the game is still artisanal in scale you can do that when the game hits factory scale, where it's 300 people, you, you just can't do moments like that because so many pieces have to be worked on by so many people that you kind of blunt the edges of that that raw, crazy emotional implementation stuff that you do. And if if I were to to kind of plan out what what I want my future to be, I want to make games that are a ton of fun. I want to make games that are really engaging. I don't I don't think I'm done with multiplayer. I want to do something really fun with multiplayer. So we're still kind of figuring out as a studio what we're doing, but we're excited. We've got a bunch of concepts in mind and we've got, we've got some experimentation we're doing going forward, but ultimately we're going to make stuff that's fun and artisanal. And that's really, I kind of think where we're headed as to what exactly that is. One of our, one of our mantras right now is find the fun first. 
let's make something, let's find the fun first, and then let's figure out how how we twiddle it and, and how we finally package it up and what exactly ships out. But we got to nail that core fun. And once we've got that core fun, from there we can build a product out of it. I mean, I, could, I, I wish I, I probably just should have shot <laughs> amen. You know, I feel like, hey, man, brother, you know. <laughs> I mean, there was a point. And you could pick pick up on this if you read the first Dungeons and Desktops book I wrote. But I just felt like, you know, I'm getting too old or something. The games just don't appeal to me. There's just not the magic's not there anymore. And people would say, well, you're just, you know, you're, you're not you're not the audience for these games or something, you know. But when I really think about it, it's not really that. It's that I did kind of I like those artisanal games where the, you could tell the people that made the game love the game and they put all their personality into the game it's there i mean that's what really sparks uh for me and yet i think that when you get to these big companies the big triple a studios and everything's it's like well what do the focus group think right yeah. <laughs> or whatever you, you, they probably you still don't get even... those moments yeah there's 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 moments now and again like I, I played through i decided i was i was way too pc focused recently so i was like okay i need to buy i need to buy a console i need to play some console stuff again so I ran out, bought myself a PlayStation, bought myself God of War, the the last one. I forget what the number is on it, but uh, played it through, and it was great. It was a great, fun story, and and I, I think this is one of the things that just came to me afterwards was that quite often when you're playing a game, it's it's kind of a lonely experience. It's you, the character, wandering through an area, through an environment, and it, you just start to feel lonely. What God of War did well was you've got your son as this companion, and he's actually adding in those little moments of companionship that actually it makes it feel not as lonely, not as it's, it's not just your quest; it's his quest as well. It's you're going on it together. You've really got somebody there working with you. And when I look back on on the Bioware games I've enjoyed, that's kind of the core of it. It's it's not only my adventure; it's my companions along with me, and they're they're keeping me from feeling lonely. Whereas like some games, you run around and it's just you. And and after about four or five hours, it kind of gets – the loneliness can get almost crushing. <laughs> You're like, God, I need to quit this for a while and go outside and see birds and life and interact with things. But I think like God of War to me was artisanal in flavor but produced by a mass team. I think uh, Balrog, I think he had such a good concept of what he wanted to make that you can still see his love of it kind of shining through. And I think there's, I think it's rare, but I think you see those games where it's that highly polished and very articulate vision of somebody who, who loved elements of it and carried those elements forward. And I think a lot of games, like you said, they kind of get blunted by focus groups and, and they get blunted by the 300 person team. Somebody implements some crazy quest and it's got some bugs in it and it's a little overcomplicated, but it's it's amazing. Well, we got to cut the complexity back. We got to fix those bugs. Okay, let's just simplify that quest and and you kind of lose the the ragged awesome of it. And I think that that doesn't happen intentionally. I think that happens by accident. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Trent, so much for this chat. I got one last thing. <laughs> sure. And I, I kind of wanted to tie a couple things together because one of the things I uh, do here at St. Cloud State is run the uh, or one of the co-faculty advisors for the Video Game Design Club. You know, so I'm always getting folks asking me, you know, what does it take? I want to make a game, but you know, what do I? Where do I go? What do I do? You know, mm -hmm. and I came across this quote from you from your blog, which I'll put a link to this as well. I think it's uh, is it TrentOster.com. Yeah, I haven't updated that for a while. I should really do that. <laughs> 2015. Well, it's still relevant. Still yeah. highly relevant information. I mean, the good stuff never gets old, right? But <laughs> yeah. uh, this is, I think, is just such a... Well, let me just read the quote. Uh, okay. So this is 2015. You say, there's a new difficulty, or the new difficulty in the games industry. That's the topic. Uh, we now face an overabundance of games, both old and new, on digital distribution platforms, and the competition for customers is fierce. So how do you break out? How do you capture an audience? How do you target, or how do you capture an audience? And your advice is to target specific audiences, have one unique feature, and something that I think you've uh, talked a lot about here is the importance of watching people 
play your game. Does that still sound uh, like what you would say today? I, I think I think it's good advice. I think I would add to it by saying kind of study the craft of the masters. Mm -hmm. Go and pick up the top ten games from the last last fifteen twenty years, and criticize them, critique them hard, and 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 be prepared to talk about what you love about them, what you think is great about them, but talk about their flaws and talk about where they're missing the mark and, and where it feels forced and where it feels clumsy. Because by analyzing other people's work, you get a much finer understanding of actually what goes into a game and, and those things that make it special. And that idea of, of like a laser focus on doing one thing, that's a simplification. It allows you as an individual to kind of hone in on that, on that narrow, narrow thing that you as a small team can do better than a 300 person studio can do. Because when I look at indie games that succeed versus I look at the mass market AAA stuff, the indie games that succeed, like say there's 10 settings in a game, there's the graphics knob, there's the audio knob, there's the story and interactive knob, there's the combat system knob. A AAA game has to have those all like eight or seven or eight mm -hmm. in every knob category. Whereas an indie game can say, okay, Two, 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 eleven, two, eleven, two, five, and they can just do this narrow thing that's amazing that a AAA game would never even think of, never even look at, never even touch. And because they're a small team and they're so focused in on it, that can be their their amazing thing that helps them stand out in a in a very crowded field. Whereas the AAA, if you jump into a AAA game and and I, the audio is is amazing, but the graphics kind of look like a little better than Minecraft. So twenty sixteen. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is not AAA. This is a, this is a ten dollar game, and you'll be on the internet typing your hate in seconds. Whereas like the indie space allows you to really really execute on that. And I think the other side of it is by focusing in so tightly, as a team, you can hone what makes that game awesome. And you can hone your craft, and and like the only way to get better at making games is to make games. You can read a lot of books, mm -hmm. you can take a lot of courses, but the time you try to ship your first game, you get punched in the face by the cruel reality that is video game development, and then you get it. Like I always talk to people, it's like, okay, have you shipped a game yet? And they're like, no. I was like, okay, where are you in your game? And they're like, oh, we're about 90% done. I was like, okay, you're about to hit the second 90%. And when you're done the second 90% of the game, you'll have it shipped. <laughs> because you start off, I always think of video games as like, a video game design is me proposing a theorem. I theorize the following will be fun and enjoyable. And then you implement it and you're like, my theory was wrong. <laughs> this is not fun. This is paint drying. This is horrible. I've crafted an atrocity. Okay, let's rethink this based on the new information. And you iterate your way to a fun game out of it. If you never built it, you wouldn't know the weaknesses of it. And only through the act of trying to make it happen do you realize the holes in your fundamental kind of ideas and concepts on what you were trying to make. And it's, it's humbling, but it's rewarding and amazing at the same time. And, and the idea of throwing it in front of somebody else and letting them play it. You're too drunk on your own Kool-Aid. You're like, oh, this is the most amazing interface mm -hmm. ever. You hand it to somebody, you sit back and you watch. And they walk to a corner and they stare at their feet and they have no idea what to do. And it's you're just like, oh, God, my master plan of how everything works and my brilliant controls are completely non-intuitive to this person. And they don't understand how to use them. I could go over and I could tell them exactly how to use them, but am I going to go to do that to everyone who buys my game? Of course, it's not scalable, so you have to rethink it and say, okay, I need it to be intuitive. I need people to be able to jump in and figure out how to do, how to play this game and, and how to use it properly. And there's so many things that you think are just blindingly obvious because you're so close to the process. And then when you see somebody play it for the first time, you're like, that is so not obvious. Oh God, we have this huge blind spot. We thought this was this was so obvious, and and now it isn't. And for me, it's it's gotten to the point where it's it's, it's even down to language, like calling a button at next. What does next mean? Well, in this one context, next could mean a lot of things. End turn. That's that's a little more obvious. But at the same time, am I ending this phase of the turn? Am I ending the entire turn? It's it's 
there's so much context around everything and there's so much clarity you require to really understand and generate a very clear action set that players can respond to so without building it it's just it seems so easy and then you build it and it's a disaster and then you you basically iterate until it's it's not a disaster anymore and without that iteration you just you can't comprehend the whole process well you heard it here folks (laughs) that's good advice Uh, so iterate make your own game see it through have other people play it yeah, iterate jump some in. more it's really jump in start making something and show it to people and listen to them don't tell them how to play it don't don't fix things by fixing that's them. gotta be hard though to watch somebody. oh it, it's brutal it's mm. so punishing you're just watching somebody <laughs> do something bad and you're like i could fix their experience just by telling them but i can't tell them and so you, the best is when you can ask them really probing questions about it. it's like so i noticed you were doing this why, why what were you expecting to happen when you click this, what do you think should be happening that it's it's not happening? When you were here, why why weren't why were you stopped there? And then sometimes they'll give you a really a non obvious answer that suddenly clicks for you. You're like, oh God, I've never taught somebody how to work a door, and suddenly I've confronted them with a door, and I've got no indicator that they need to go interact with this thing. It's just, or in some cases like a Baldur's Gate game. The door is on, on the bottom of the screen. You can't see it. For players who aren't actively searching for that little bar that marks the top of a doorway, they'll never see it. Yeah, that's got to be a few times. Those are kind of like Baldur's Gate-isms. They're like <laughs> the non-intuitive <laughs> things that Baldur's Gate does that because we're curating it, we can't fix it. But at the same time, we can go in and, and make it a little brighter in the art or tweak it up a little bit, but we can't outright fix it. So it's... It's just those subtle things, and, and until you watch other people play your games, you don't really understand the game experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just recently had a, the Crimson Diamond, a little adventure game. Okay. And I was playing it, and I had the video, I was sort of playing it for her, uh, and she was like taking notes the whole time. And <laughs> I was like, you know, I feel like I'm doing some usability testing or something here <laughs> uh, for her. But, you know, I, I could see where that could be fun too. It's, it's really interesting because it causes you to look at your game in a different way. Mm-hmm. And you start to see it through the eyes of a new player. And, and suddenly these leaps that you make automatically, you, you get that they're really non-obvious. And you're like, oh, God, I need to – oh, that needs to be so much easier to use. That needs – I need to drive that connection much clearer. And until you watch somebody play your game – you think everything's great. And then you watch somebody play your game, you're like, I've made a smoking pile of disaster. Yeah, I guess with the... I'm thinking about this with all the YouTube videos and Let's Plays and all that stuff out there. You probably watch those and to make, and make notes about... Because you're constantly making patches and hot fixes and all this stuff for these games. And, you know, that's and something we didn't have back in the day, so I don't... <laughs> yeah. A lot of it's, ways, it's I'm a, very lucky to have that. Yeah, it's a great it's a great thing to have, and as well, like with Baldur's Gate, with Neverwinter Nights, we have these online communities, and they're they're very anxious to tell us things that are not obvious to them and things that don't make sense. And we quite often reach back out to fans who post, and we're like, "What exactly do you mean by this? What part was not obvious? Okay, where where did you where did you fall off the trail here? Where did you lose this path? Okay, oh, or in some cases, they're trying to perform an action, and there should be an intuitive way to do it." when what we think the intuitive way is, is actually totally, it doesn't make sense at all. So either A, we've got to put in a better way of educating players to play that, or B, we've got to figure out a better mechanism for for doing those kind of actions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a bit of both. Well, thanks, Trent. Been a great chat. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you... No, I I think we we hit pretty far. Go play Axis Allies Online, for sure, 19... Yeah, um, Tyrants of the Moon Sea Tyrants just came out. Uh, it's pretty awesome. The Austin guys did a, did a stand-up job. Uh, Neverwinter, we're we're working on the renderer. Um, it'll come out on the console version. So Neverwinter is going to look a fair bit different when we're done. It's going to definitely take a big step forward graphically in what it what the engine is capable of. And from the modding standpoint, this is probably the most open graphics engine on the planet. 
So I'm really anxious to see what, wow. what the modders can do with it. Because like, my business partner, Cameron, rewrote it, and he rewrote it in such a way that it's based on techniques. And you can create, as a, as a modder, you can create your own techniques. So I'm so anxious to see what level of experimentation this gets. And then I think the final is uh, Access Analyze uh, 1942 Online. It's the 1942 second edition Access and Allies. It's, it's basically me trying to fix the game experience where as I'm older, I can't get together with my friends for like six, seven hours that it takes to play through the board game, getting us all in the same room. It's really built around this concept of asynchronous play. It's almost like chess by email. I jump in, I see where the game's at, I make my turn. I finish, I submit it, the next guy goes. At any time, I can check back, see what's happening in the world, and then when my turn comes around, I get a notification and I can jump right back in. It's really us trying to make Axis and Allies, the game you used to love, fit into your schedule and your, your current reality. And uh, I think in that context, I think we did a really good job of it. I think it's quite, quite a, a fun experience, and I'm loving the game, and I'm still actively playing it. At any given time, I probably have at least two games active, Probably as many as five at one point, but wow. I start forgetting what game I'm in when I've got five going. I'm like, okay, I was trying to take Corellia here. Okay, is this that game? Is this the Corellia game or is this the other game? <laughs> but it's a ton of fun. And uh, I actually reached out to a bunch of my friends I used to play with in university and high school. And I, I invited them into it early in the beta and we played together. And it oh, was, that's it was cool. just a ton of fun. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm sure there's lots of people that are probably already playing, but <laughs> it sounds like if you're at all interested in, in strategy games, this is the one right now. To... It's pretty, it's pretty cool experience, and being able to play it asynchronous like that, you can really make it fit yeah. in like ten minutes here, ten minutes there. Well, that's which... what I hear from people. You know, I I can't get into that, play World of Warcraft or whatever because I don't have you know twelve hours or whatever <laughs> ridiculous uh, time it takes. But you know, this is you got what ten minutes you can play your yeah, play you play your turn. your turn. You get your notification, you can play your turn, and then the, it goes on to the next person. There's no pressure um, on that other person to hurry up and... <laughs> I yeah, remember that. We, I don't know if you ever played Empire. You ever play Empire back in the day? Yeah. You know, my yeah, dad and I would play that all hours of the night. There's always this pressure of like, hurry up with your turn, you know? <laughs> yeah. We set it up so there's a 24-hour timeout, so you have 24 hours to make your turn. But going forward, what we're going to do is expand that out. So when you start the game, you can set what that timeline is. Mm -hmm. So if you want a fast and furious game, you could set that time out to like one hour. So after an hour, you can try to kick another player out for not taking their turn. Right now it's at 24 hours, but we're also talking about setting it to a week, giving people a long time to strategize. And I found the cadence is usually everybody takes their turn in two or three hours. I've had a couple where people are taking an entire day to make their turn and it it's still enjoyable. It's still a lot of fun. You still keep going. And, and uh, we've got it set up so you can set notes on the map to your allies or even to yourself. So I've been using that a fair bit where I'll put down a map note. It's like, next turn, I'm going to attack Corellia here. Remember that. <laughs> so they come back <laughs> to the game and I'm like, sir. oh, I made a note for myself. Okay, now I know, remember where I'm at. Well, that's handy. All right. Well, thanks again, Trent. Have a great day. Yeah, it was good, great fun. chatting with you. Yeah, likewise. I'll have to do this again sometime. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. And here we go, the promised announcement from George Zeiss. Now, just quickly, if you don't know who George is, I'll be t uh, interviewing him extensively over the next few weeks. Uh, but just in short, he's the uh, writer of, or, or the creative lead, whatever you want to call him, on Mask of the Betrayer, uh, the Neverwinter Nights 2 expansion. Of course, he worked on uh, Neverwinter Nights 2. Uh, let's see what else he's done. Torment, Tides of Numenera, Dungeon Siege 3, uh, Earth and Beyond, <laughs> and many more titles. And he's got a lot to say about game design and philosophy. Uh, but here he is to talk about his plans for the immediate future. So stay tuned. All right, folks, I am here with the great George Zeitz. He is a veteran of lots of the studios that, whose games we've covered on this show, games studios I'm sure you're familiar with, including Westwood Studios, Obsidian, and In Exile. He was the creative lead on uh, one of my favorite uh, CRPG narratives of all time, Mask of the Betrayer. Uh, and he's also worked on Torment, Tides of Numenera, and Wasteland 3, just to name a few. 
And George, you were just telling me that you are opening a new studio. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. Correct. Um, so we are called uh, Digimancy Entertainment. Um, Digimancy. We're going to be making Digimancy, yes, like Digital Mancy. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I see what uh, you did there. Indeed. Um, we're going to be making uh, RPGs and RPG hybrids uh, with a focus on great narratives, strong, strong characters, basically the kind of stuff that, that we've been doing in the past for the last 15, 20 years. Um, something that I've been talking about and thinking about for a long time. Um, obviously, I've worked on a few spiritual successors in my time. Uh, I've worked on quite a lot of sequels and franchise games. Um, so I'm really interested in working on some new and original stuff. Um, original settings, new IPs. We're actually starting on something that we're super excited about. Uh, we are also interested in doing existing IPs, but especially stuff that hasn't been done in a long time, or maybe that's never been seen in uh, RPGs before. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think of like Wizards of the Coast has all these cool properties laying around that they haven't done anything with for a while, Ravenloft, um, gosh, oh, Dark Ravenloft, Sun, Dragonlance. Yeah. Like I'd love to work on any of those. So if, if Watsi is listening, like let us know. We would be we would be very happy to work on that stuff. Um, technically, we're based in Columbus, Ohio, so we're a Midwestern studio where it's actually affordable to live, which is another really nice thing. Um, we are also embracing the remote model of work, uh, so it's more like I don't really care where you are, um, as long as you are super excited about our. RPGs and you really want to work on these games, like, I'm happy to find a way to work with, with people no matter where they live. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, hopefully be back, uh, hoping for next week. We'll see how it goes, but there's some uh, conferences and things coming up. Uh, that I, I have to prepare for. So I can't make any promises, but I will be back as soon as possible with our new interview series with the great George Zeitz. So uh, stay tuned. I know you guys are going to love that. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much with a big juicy rat right on top just waiting for the hammer blow to fall <laughs> uh, just for you, set him up for you. Uh, in gratitude for supporting the show, keeping Matt Chat on the air through all these years. Can you believe it? Uh, it's not me, folks. It's all about you. It's uh, You're the ones uh, keeping the show on, keeping these episodes coming, keeping these interviews coming. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Uh, you just will never know how much I appreciate that. Uh, also, uh, if you would like to uh, do more than uh, simply watch the show, you can, of course, go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Uh, subscribe uh, to the show, whatever amount you like. I like <laughs> a buck a show is fine. If you want to go two bucks, that's even better. <laughs> uh, all not, you know, whatever you're comfortable with and the show is worth to you. Uh, guys, I appreciate that. So thank you. All right. Quite a bit of news. So uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, first up, you're a bit of fun. This is Chekadev wrote in about this game. He's uh, coming out in a, uh, sometime before Halloween. I think I want to say the 25th of October. Could be wrong about that. But anyway, it's called Type Night. Uh, it describes it as a short atmospheric typing game. Type as fast as you can on your keyboard to survive. Discover what lies at the end of the cemetery at the cost of your life. Uh, so this seems like a you know, a little casual game. It kind of reminds me a little bit in, in uh, I guess, thematically anyway, of the old Typing of the Dead game. <laughs> Remember that far back. Uh, anyway, this is just kind of way more fun than it should be. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> I kind of got sucked into this this morning, and uh, I got pretty far into it. I got past the first boss, and uh, I want to say close to 50,000 points, and something like 95% uh, uh, accuracy of the keyboards. So I was really proud of that. Uh, anyway, I think you have a lot of fun. I don't know what the price point is for this, but keep an eye out for this type night game. Uh, if you want to improve your typing skills, just have some fun. Hey, maybe you got some kids you're trying to teach typing, uh, keyboarding, you know, if they don't already know that. Uh, I think they'd have a lot of fun with it. It's, just, it's kind of one of those games you're playing it, people come by, see it, and they want to play too. So I think it's a, 
going to be a hit for Chakadev. Chakadev. Uh, also, of course, Disco Elysium is out. Uh, this is a ground. I've, I've mentioned it a few times uh, in passing, but this is. I really want to do a proper review of this game as soon as I get some time. You know, it's always, see, it feels like feast or famine sometimes with these releases, right? <laughs> it's like you sit around all summer with nothing to play, and then boom, we're like uh, hit with 17 different awesome games all at once. So it's, you know, I just hope that these games don't get lost in the shuffle. Uh, but it doesn't look like Disco Elysium will be one of those. This is a groundbreaking open world role playing game where you play a detective with a unique skill system at your disposal. Uh, so it's really all about the uh, the character interaction in this game. Uh, I haven't really, I'm trying to keep away from spoilers because I want to uh, play it for myself, but I've been looking at the reviews. They're very, very positive. Uh, they're talking about the freedom of the choice, uh, freedom of choice you have in this game, the options, sweet talking. You can even write poetry, apparently, sing karaoke and dance. <laughs> uh, so this sounds like a lot of fun. I found out one of the reviews by Mark H 4 from off the Steam site. And I really like, you know, if he's not just completely full of it, I think this is a game for me. Here's the way Mark describes it. Quote, I've only played Disco Elysium for a few nights, and I can say that this is the spiritual successor to PST, Planescape Torment. And I found the writing to be so engaging that I actually considered skipping work on Thursday in order to stay home and play. <laughs> I don't need much of an excuse to want to skip work and <laughs> stay home to play. But, <laughs> but anyway, you pick this up. It's $39 or basically 40 bucks on Steam right now. Uh, so not cheap, but you know, you uh, you pay the, the more money you pay, I guess, the more money the developer gets and the quicker they'll have more content for you. So uh, there you go. Uh, also, a lot of folks have been writing in about this... Um, uh, this big expansion to the Internet Archive. So basically what they've done is added a whole bunch of old DOS games. They're saying thousands. Uh, they're talking about Wizardry, Crusaders of the Dark Savant, somebody called Princess Maker 2. No idea what that is. Uh, Microsoft Adventure. Uh, it's kind of weird the games they picked out to celebrate this. But I was having a look through it, and they, they do have quite a few of the more obscure titles, which I think that's what something like the Internet Archive is great for. You know, games that don't necessarily have a lot of commercial value that, Probably wouldn't see on GOG or uh, Steam, or obviously uh, uh, not on Steam, but nevertheless, you might be tracking down to want to play. Uh, you know, the one I tried was called the Tracer Sanction, an old adventure game from Interplay. Kind of heard about it off and on, but, but I was able to just to click on it. Maybe a minute later, I was actually playing it right in the browser. <laughs> DOS box and everything uh, set up for you. Uh, so that's pretty awesome. I don't know the legality of all this. You know, I guess this is abandonware. You know, I don't know what kind of, you know, how, how careful they've been about crossing their T's and dotting their I's uh, legally with this, but hopefully this, this will stay up so we can uh, at least finally get access to some of these games, not have to uh, <laughs> resort to those sort of scary, dodgy kind of abandonware sites with, you know, all the uh, ads and uh, viral or malware and all that junk. Uh, finally, the fourth item I thought was really kind of cool. Uh, Somebody was digging around, and they found this old uh, vinyl album from 1984. It's a Christian rock band uh, named Prodigal. Never heard of them. Or the album Electric Eye. <laughs> Never heard of it. Uh, but what happened was they noticed there was a little Commodore 64 logo on there. And so the, this guy, let me see what's his name. I think his name was Paul. Uh, but he was digging around on this and figured out a way to get the, uh, figured out there was a program that had been etched onto this, a Commodore 64 basic program. And so he was able to record the audio, get it in onto a magnetic cassette, and actually play it on his Commodore, so you can watch the video where he's talking all about this process. But uh, I'll, I'll save it as a surprise. You can watch the video to see what the program contained. <laughs> kind of Easter egg, if you will. Uh, but how cool is that? You know, After all these years, somebody finally finds this old Easter egg and <laughs> what a cool uh, Easter egg. Uh, so anyway, thanks. That's ONS Good over at Polygon.com. All right, let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was looking uh, for quotes about taking the initiative, you know, just getting it done, not waiting for other people, but just going out there and doing it on your own. And lots of quotes like that, but this was a really good one. And it's by Christopher McCandless. Uh, he's an American hiker and explorer. Uh, there's a book about him in a, some movies, or a movie and a documentary. And the book is called Into the Wild. Uh, but anyway, the quote goes something like this. So many people live within unhappy circumstances and yet will not take the initiative to change their situation. 
because they are conditioned to a life of security, conformity, and conservation, all of which may appear to give one peace of mind, but in reality, nothing is more damaging to the adventurous spirit. So I think there's some uh, truth to that. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and see you next time. Unedited footage has been declassified by the Banzai Institute for Biomedical Engineering and Strategic Information.